This video will show how to compute the Laplace transform of the unit step function from the integral definition of the Laplace transform. Um, this is something that is really useful to have done once, but after you understand what the Laplace transform of the unit step function is, uh, you typically just look it up in a table or you remember it. Uh, the utility of this exercise is hopefully to make it clearer why we worry about regions of convergence and exactly how this integral uh, definition of the Laplace transform works. So, as you will no doubt recall, uh, the unit step function looks something like this. So it has a value of 1 for values of t greater than 0 and a value of 0 for values of t less than 0. So to compute the Laplace transform of the unit step function, which we'll call capital U of s, by the definition of the Laplace transform, it's the integral from minus infinity to infinity of u of t e to the minus st dt. Okay, so basically to do the computation here I'm going to take the e to the minus st, multiply it by u of t. u of t is 1 as long as t is greater than 0 and 0 as long as t is less than 0. So the first thing I can do is take this lower limit of integration and replace it by 0. Again, the reason for that is because u of t is 0 for values of t less than 0. So the product of u of t and e to the minus st is also 0. So using that and the fact that u of t is 1 now for the uh, between 0 and infinity, I can write this as the integral of minus infinity e to the minus, or from 0 to infinity, e to the minus st dt. Okay, now you'll notice, this is an important aside, I guess, so we'll do it in an important pink. The uh, integral that I've defined here is the bilateral Laplace transform, because my limits of integration are minus infinity to infinity the integral that I've defined here is the unilateral Laplace transform because now my limits are from 0 to infinity. And the reason that this is true is that u of t is a function that's 0 for values of t less than 0. So for the unit step function the bilateral Laplace transform and the unilateral Laplace transform are the same thing. Okay. And we'll discover that this is true in general. In fact, hopefully it's obvious to you that this is true in general for signals that are zero for values of t less than zero. Okay, so now the only thing left to do is to uh, work out this integral. And if I remember how to do integrals correctly, which is not likely, the minus s, and recall again, that this is an integral with respect to t. Okay, so the minus s is a constant in terms of this integral. So I have e to a constant t, so uh, when I'm working the integral it's going to be 1 over that constant times e to the minus st evaluated at 0 and infinity. Okay, well let's tidy up this uh, important pink note. And first let's look at um, what e to the minus st evaluated at 0 is. Well, I plug in a 0 for s 
this is e to the 0, because 0 times t is 0, which is equal to 1. Okay, so that one was easy to do. What about e to the minus st evaluated at infinity? That's basically this upper limit of integration over here. Well, what is this going to be? This is um, the limit as t approaches infinity of e to the minus st. Okay. Well, this limit is either going to, well, in order for this limit to exist, I need to have something be true about s. So let's actually write out what s is. Uh, here, we'll erase that equal sign. That was a little premature. Okay, so s, if you'll remember, is a sigma plus j omega. Okay, so it's a real plus and an imaginary part. So e to the minus st, I can write as e to the minus sigma plus j omega t. Okay, and I can break this into the product of e to the minus sigma t times e to the minus j omega t. Okay, now in order to figure out what's going on with the limit, I need to figure out what this chunk of the product is going to do. And if sigma is greater than 0, so that e to the minus sigma t is always less than 0 as t, uh, if t is, as t approaches infinity, then as t approaches infinity, this term is going to approach 0. Okay, so as long as sigma is greater than 0, this term over here is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller as t gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and it eventually will uh, get close to 0. This term, this e to the minus j omega t, requires a little more thought, at least if you're not um, familiar with this. So I'll bring it over here so we've got a little bit of room to think about it. You'll recall from Euler's formula, this is a cosine omega t plus, oh, and I've got a negative sign here, so this is a cosine of negative omega t plus j sine of minus omega t. Okay, so this has a real part and an imaginary part. The thing that's important for us to note right now is that the real part is always between minus 1 and 1, and the magnitude of the imaginary part is always between minus 1 and 1. No matter what value of t I choose here, the cosine and the sine, both uh, both of those functions are limited to have values between minus 1 and 1. So it turns out that both the real and imaginary parts of this uh, e to the minus j omega t have values that are between 1 and minus 1, because this guy here, the e to the minus sigma t, is approaching 0 as long as sigma is greater than 0. And this term has values that are bounded. The product of these two is going to approach 0 as t approaches 0. Or I'm sorry, as t approaches infinity. Okay. Again, the e to the minus j omega terms, these terms wiggle back and forth between 1 and minus 1, but I'm multiplying them by something that's approaching 0 as t gets big, and so the whole thing approaches 0. So what that says is that this limit is equal to 0 as long as sigma is greater than 0. Okay, if sigma is Oops, let's not do this in that color. Uh, let's see, what's the color for a comment? Um, peach. 
Okay, if sigma is less than zero, then this limit as t goes to infinity doesn't exist because the e to the minus sigma t, uh, if sigma is less than zero, then minus sigma t is greater than zero. So as t gets large, this gets even larger, the e to the minus sigma t. So if sigma is less than or equal to or less than zero, then this limit doesn't exist. So to summarize what we've developed so far, we have that um, for this lower limit of integration, uh, the uh, e to the minus st is 1. For the upper limit of integration, infinity, e to the minus st goes to 0 as long as sigma is greater than 0. So using that, after first cleaning up some stuff here, While we're tidying up, we'll be tidy about a couple of things. Okay, we have that this is minus 1 over s, 0 minus 1. Again, this is the limit as t goes to infinity. This is the value for t is equal to 0, which is just 1 over s. Okay, so we have that the Fourier transform is 1 over s. The region of convergence of this Fourier transform in the complex plane, so I have the real and imaginary axes, is for, for every s that has a value of sigma greater than 0, you remember that's the requirement that we have for this term here to go to 0, so for every value of s for sigma greater than 0, the integral converges, which means that my region of convergence is this value. Okay, so um, this essentially concludes the Laplace transform of the unit step function. There's actually one last thing that I need to uh, do to make this complete, but I'm out of uh, time. The thing that I will do to make this complete is look at a unit step function. Well, look at another, well, yeah, essentially it's a, a shifted or a, a inverted unit step function where the region of convergence is over here, just to show you that you can get the same one over s, but with a different region of convergence. But that will happen in the next video.